Welcome to this time of worship. I am so glad that you are joining us as we gather in the presence of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit to offer our worship, thanksgiving, praises, and prayers to the Lord and to receive all that He would give to us by way of His Word and His presence and all that He would have in store for us to receive this night. We are starting a new tradition here in our congregation. It began last week as we began our journey into the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday. Uh, We introduced the candelabra of diminishing light. The season of Epiphany, which we just completed recently, showed us the power and the light and the majesty and the glory of Christ as the Son of God in whom the fullness of God dwells. And in the season of Lent, we focus on the Christ as the Son of Man, fully human, who suffered and died for our sins. And each week, we will extinguish an additional candle to remind us of the journey Christ made to a cross where He died, having the darkness and the guilt of our sin laid upon Him. Now last week we extinguished the first candle of diminishing light, the candle of ashes. And tonight we extinguished the candle of self-denial. Christ denied Himself so much of the common and ordinary things that most of us enjoy. The Bible says that He did not even have a home or a place that was His own where He could lay His head. And he humbly took on the form of a servant, even to the extent of giving up his life on a dark afternoon when the sun refused to shine. And all of that was done to save us, to make us the children of the Heavenly Father and co-heirs with him of all his heavenly treasures. So tonight, we extinguish the candle of self-denial, remembering all that Christ gave up in his life in order to fulfill His purpose of becoming, for all people, our Savior and our Lord. Jesus said, No one has greater love, no one has shown stronger affection than this, to give up his own life for his friends. You are my friends. Let us begin tonight's service. We are gathered and make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In his penitential Psalm 32, David confessed his sins before Almighty God and prayed to be forgiven. So let us also confess our sins before Almighty God, knowing that God has promised that when we confess our sins, He will be faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and save us for the sake of Christ. Oh, what joy for those whose rebellion is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sins, I was weak and miserable, and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was upon me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly confess their rebellion to you while there is still time that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. Join me in this confession of sins. O merciful God, 
I have sinned against you, your commandments, and your holy will, by my thoughts, words, and deeds, and by what I have done and by what I have left undone. I implore your mercy and grace, and that for the sake of the death and shed blood of Christ, that you forgive me all my sins. From Psalm 32, again we hear, The Lord says, I will guide you along the best path of life. I will advise you and watch over you. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust in you. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all who all you who obey Him. Shout for joy, all whose hearts are pure. The Lord has cleansed you of sin, and your guilt by the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven on account of Christ. This is declared in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God, and praise be to Christ our Savior. And let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, even while we were still yet sinners, You died for us. So overwhelm us with Your unconditional and sacrificial love that with fervent gratitude we may boldly and without shame proclaim Your redemptive love and your salvation to all the inhabitants of the earth. We ask this, O Christ, in your name. You are the Eternal One, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and you rule and reign over all things together as one God. Amen.
The single scripture reading we have to share with you tonight on this second Wednesday in Lent is taken from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to come, become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not Put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. My dear friends in Christ, if you weren't raised in a Christian liturgical denomination, the idea of giving up something for the 40-day season of Lent may seem very strange to you. Uh, indeed, for some, even observing a special time of the year preceding Easter, this thing that we call the season of Lent, is a little bit of a stranger to them, and some wonder why uh, we observe it at all, and uh, why we even practice certain things during this particular season. They think it's just a little bit unusual or even maybe weird. To observe Lent is not commanded in the Bible, of course, and yet historically many Christians have viewed and used Lent as a time and opportunity to focus attention on God's love for us, such a great love that it caused Him to send His own Son into the world to die for our sins. One of the historical practices of the church through the centuries has been to give something up for Lent. Uh, the idea is to give up something that we like a lot or maybe even love. Uh, it can be a food. It can be an activity. And it's given up in order to remind us of God's sacrificial love and all that Christ gave up in order to bring about the forgiveness of our sins reconciliation with the Father, and guaranteeing entry into heaven for us where we will enjoy everlasting life in the presence of Christ. You know, I remember when I was a kid, my best friend, Ray, uh, Ray DeMarty is his name, uh, who was part of a very devout Catholic family, had to give up candy every year for Lent. I mean, not just the 40 days, but also including the Sundays, starting from Ash Wednesday all the way through and including Good Friday. <laughs> and I used to think to myself, wow, I'm glad I'm a Lutheran. I don't have to do that kind of thing. But looking back, I realized that I gave up things too during the season of Lent, like giving up time with my friends in order to go to church and to worship and learn more about Jesus and what He did in order to secure our salvation, even adding Wednesday night Lenten services to my weekly schedule 
even though I was very busy in high school with basketball and, and schoolwork and, and baseball and all that kind of stuff. But I'll tell you, I actually loved going to special services like that. I just loved it. I wouldn't miss it. I remember one time, by the way, when I was a senior in high school, and I was just starting to date one of my classmates. And I told her that I would not be meeting her at the library and hanging out with her that night or even talking to her on the phone that night because I was going to church that Wednesday night. Well, she was intrigued, and she actually asked if she could go with me. And so I said, of course, and I went and I picked her up and and I took her to church with me. I, I loved my church, and I loved taking people to my church all the time, and so I was happy to do it for this girl that I was uh, trying to date. Now, my dad, who was the pastor, was doing some first-person monologue sermons based on the characters who are part of the whole passion, the Bible's account of Jesus' work of giving up his life in order to secure our redemption. And my dad had chosen for that particular night an impersonation, a first-person impersonation of the devil. Yep, Satan himself, with all of his evil influences and guile, the one who seeks to destroy our relationship with God and tempt us to reject and turn away from Christ and his love and all he did for us. Now, I have to say, and I can remember that sermon even to this day, it was awesome. He played the role devilishly, devilishly well. And that young lady that I took to church that night, she was scared out of her wits, at least for the first part of the sermon, when my dad was explaining as though he were the treacherous one himself, the evil one, as to his motives, his work, as the devil and the evil one to undermine the work of God in our lives, to steal us away and to destroy us. But my dad ended that sermon with a message of the gospel, still playing the role of the devil and with all of the uh, imagination of the devil's pride and hate towards Christ and his arrogant disdain for Jesus because the devil knew what was ahead for Jesus, the laying down of his life, the giving up of his own blood on the cross in order to pay the penalty for our sins, to redeem us and buy us back, to leave the record of our sins as dead in their impact and influence upon us, along with their consequences, as the body of Jesus was dead on the cross that Good Friday. And that the devil in this moment was woefully admitting his ultimate defeat and the disarming of his power and the power of sin and temptation and even death on us all. I have to tell you a little secret. I watched this young lady who is sitting on my right as we made our way listening through the sermon. And I happened to take notice of her face and her body language out of the corner of my eye. I tell you, I'm absolutely certain that her heart and soul went from sheer terror about sin and being lost in the eternal apartness from God to total peace of resting securely in the work of Jesus Christ. When my dad ended his message, she turned and looked at me and into my eyes, and she, just, she simply said, Wow. I had witnessed a moment of conversion, a mighty work of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit in her life. And she let me know that by saying, Wow. You know, giving up things during Lent for the season can have a transformational impact on you and me because these moments can turn into times when our relationship with Christ deepens, that we come to know Him better, that we understand the profundity and the enormity of His love. 
And by the way, if things like that don't, whether it's an extra time of prayer every day or extra times of worship during the week or extra reading of the Bible on a daily basis or doing additional good works for the charity and the good of others, if it doesn't deepen our relationship with Christ, if it doesn't increase our gratitude for what Christ has done in His suffering and sacrifice to forgive and to save us, well, it's, it's just not worth doing. It's a waste of time. It's a vain ritual. You might, by the way, rather than giving something up for Lent, try adding something to for Lent. Um, more time with the Lord in prayer. More time reading a daily devotional Lenten booklet or reading through the Gospel of John slowly, meditatively, prayerfully. But it's all about the attitude of your heart. The attitude of your heart is either giving something up or adding something to, but it's all about whether you're doing it for the right reason with the right results. It's all about deepening your love and affection for Christ or causing your heart to grow in gratitude for what He has done. And if that happens, no matter what you're doing, I don't care what it is, it's a good thing. It's a transformational thing. I'd like to close, by the way, by giving you a list of 13 things you might consider giving up for Lent. Now, these are a little bit different than what we've been talking about. And by the way, it was another pastor who shared these with me, and now I want to share them with you. These are things to give up, not just for Lent, by the way, but for the rest of your life. Number one, guilt. Give up guilt because you are loved by Jesus and He has forgiven you all your sins. Every day is a new day and the past is left behind. Number two, fear. Give up fear because God is on your side. In Him you are more than a conqueror, the Bible says. Three, the need to please everyone. Why? Because you already know that you can't please everyone anyway, and there's only one person in all of creation that you should strive to please, and He's always going to accept whatever it is you do that gives Him glory. He's the one who is already pleased with you. Number four, envy. Why give up envy? Because you are already blessed. Your value is not found in your possessions, but they are found in the fact that God made you. He created you as His workmanship, and He has a relationship with you. You have a relationship with the Heavenly Father, and He has pledged to meet your needs, all of them. Also, give up impatience. Why? Because God's timing is always perfect. Give up also a sense of entitlement. Because the world does not owe you anything, God does not even owe you anything, but God will take care of you and you will lack nothing. Give up bitterness and resentment. Why? Because the only person you are hurting by holding on to these things is yourself. And these attitudes are not of God or from God, and they are not on that list of becoming like Christ. Give up blame, give up gossip, and give up negativity because spewing out these three actions or attitudes destroys relationships. Relationships with you and the Father and with your neighbors in the world. Forgiveness and restoration are the way to true friendship and fellowship. Give up comparing yourself to others because God has made you unique and special. You are His workmanship, designed to give Him glory in all that you would do. Give up a spirit of poverty as though you have nothing, because God is always more than enough, and He gives more than enough to meet every one of your needs. Certainly give up your feelings of unworthiness, because God says about you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made by Him, the Creator, the Extraordinary One, and He extraordinary loves you. And give up doubt, 
Because God has a plan for your future that is beyond anything that you can possibly imagine, and it's good, and it's perfect, and that future is brighter than anything you could ever realize. Give up also worry, because God is in complete control. And by the way, worrying will not help you anyway, nor will it change God's perfect plan that He's working out under His design and control for your life. So just give it up. I read in a magazine article yesterday that was posted on the internet that was asking an interesting question about Lent uh, during this particular year of 2021. And it was about giving up things for Lent, interestingly. This article was at first proposing that maybe we have already, as people in this world, given up enough over the last year. You know, because of that whole COVID thing and all the stuff that has come because of it. Some have given up, you know, their health. Uh, some have even given up their lives. Uh, some have had all the wonderful experiences that are resulted uh, from spending time together with their family and their friends, and it was all taken away. They gave it up. They had to. Others have given up their enriching conversations with their neighbors and the things that they do with their fellow Christians, even at church, and when they're together, that strengthen our faith and strengthen our well-being. And of course, so many have given up hope. The writer was asking, do we really have to give up chocolate this year, this Lent, when we've been giving up so much over the past 12 months? I suppose it's a good question. And it reminds us that, yes, we have given up a lot in the sense of things that we've had to endure through this past year. But should we still give up chocolates? Should we still give up our time in order to spend it in prayer or reading the Word of God or worshiping Him? Well, the answer is yes, if. Yes, if we can still discover our give-ups, and our take-ons for Lent that will cause us to be ever more dependent upon Jesus, ever more relying on the peace of the Holy Spirit, ever more being reminded of what Christ both gave up and took on for us so that we today would walk away from that moment or that experience with a greater love, a deeper relationship, and an increased praise of Him because of all that He did to make us His own, to save us. If giving up or taking on something leads us to that end, then yes, that's what we want, because it will transform us, not just for today, not just for these next 40 days of Lent 2021, but forever. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, Keep our hearts and minds in faith, in Jesus Christ, unto life everlasting. Amen.
For this evening's prayers, I would first of all like to share with you a very famous evening prayer that is titled, Abide With Us. That will be followed then by asking you to join my voice in speaking together the Song of Simeon that is also known as the Nunc Dimittis from the New Testament. And then we will speak the Lord's Prayer together and we will conclude by speaking Luther's evening prayer together before we conclude the service with the benediction. Let us now pray. Abide with us, Lord, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. Abide with us and with your whole church. Abide with us in the evening of the day, in the evening of life, in the evening of the world, abide with us in your grace and mercy, in your word and sacraments, in your comfort and your blessing. Abide with us in the night of distress and fear, in the night of doubt and temptation, in the night of bitter death, when these shall overtake us. Abide with us and with all your faithful ones, O Lord, in time and in eternity. Amen. And now speak the words of the Song of Simeon. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. And now, according to His promises, and as He has taught us, we are bold as our Lord Jesus has taught us as the church to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Please join me now in speaking Luther's evening prayer together. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angels be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Blessed assured. Stand my
my side.